Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M by 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in revenue, build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. And in support of that mission, we do these roundtables week after week after week. This is the 499th session of the 1M by 1M roundtables. So this has been going on for a very, very, very long time. Since the fall of 2008, we've done it almost every week. In any given calendar year, we've probably you know, had a bit of vacation here and there, but um, it's been a very consistent show. And every single recording of the uh, series is available on the 1M, 1M Roundtable YouTube channel. Um, our Twitter handles are at 1M by 1M and at Stromana. We publish a lot of material through that. And hashtag 1M 1M is your hashtag for today if you like tweeting. Uh, this is a roundtable, not a broadcast. We do have scheduled programming, but we also want you to participate. So. The numbers here, I will put the slide back up when we are ready. In the meantime, you can publicly, uh, you can interact with the public chat. So set your chat to send to all participants. Today, we're going to start the session with a conversation with Roberto Milk, CEO and co-founder of Novica. Roberto was on the Entrepreneur Journey series recently, and I had a wonderful conversation and really found his journey extremely inspiring, so I invited Roberto to participate in this roundtable to build on that discussion. Roberto, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So glad to be here. So Roberto, let's get you introduced to our audience. Tell us a bit about yourself as well as what you're doing with Novica. Well, uh, you know, Novica is a platform for artists around the world. And my grandmother on my Peruvian side was one of our very first artisans. And the whole system was born from this need to find a better way for artisans to reach the world market. And it's a need that I saw uh, with my family traveling when I was a kid. My brother and I would, would uh, explore markets as we went to countries, uh, especially uh, my parents. We were growing up in the States. My parents were living in San Antonio, Texas. And my mom, being Peruvian, uh, she, she, every summer came around, they were both teachers. She said, I got to get back to, uh, to Peru and, and, and see my people. <laughs> so we would go to Peru and we would go other, other places. And, and these, these early childhood discoveries um, in so many ways uh, influenced the company that, that uh, we're running now. You know, uh, you know, we are, my husband and I are avid travelers, and, and one of the things we really love is markets and artisans. So we, when we are traveling, we always seek out, you know, where we can look at works by artisans and where are the markets and so on. So when you shared your story with me recently, I found it so inspiring and, and also so fun. And I've always wondered how these people uh, would go to market and, and find their audience and so forth. And then one of the stories that I remember very well is we were in a small town in India called Shantiniketan, which is a, a very um, artistic place. It was, I don't know if you are familiar with this place. It's, um, it's where Rabindranath Tagore had his university, and um, mm. there are tons of artists and artisans there. And uh, we were invited to a home, and there were all these women who – who are trying to make a living with embroidery. And the embroidery is beautiful, but it's mm -hmm. very overworked. So they're putting in so much work on one piece. And we were mm. looking at that and we were saying, you know, you can do one-tenth of the work and you'll find a bigger market just because people don't want that complicated <laughs> stuff. They just want simpler things. <laughs> and, of course, you know, they're so far removed from the market that it's, it's very difficult for them to... Um, grasp these nuances of minimalism and the trends right. of the modern market. So yeah, anyway, so funny. you sound like one of our product sourcing people right now. Hearing you speak, <laughs> you could, you, could uh, you know, we, uh, your input would be very valuable. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I also ran a fashion company. It's one of the first oh, things no I started. Wonder. No <laughs> wonder. I have a lot of experience with. <laughs> so uh, tell us a bit about the artisans. Let's start the discussion with artisans. And, and what I would like to focus on, as you know, our mission is one million by one million. So in a mm -hmm. marketplace like yours, obviously, you have had tremendous impact on the lives of very small entrepreneurs. So tell us about a few of those that have been particularly successful, who they are, where are they from, and what is special about the ones that are really, you know, making a big uh, success on your platform. Okay, great. Yeah. You know, just listening to your, your story about the market in India really reminds me of, of um, really kind of how, how blessed we are in a way that, that um, one of my childhood passions, which was to go to the markets, right? Like yeah. this has become one where rather than when we were kids, we were looking for just a cool product. You know, it's like, oh, we need something cool for our room, something unique, you know, that none of our friends have. But um, then as an adult, um, when I travel, we get to do that. Um, my wife and I, my wife's a co-founder. Um, my brother, who I spoke about, he's a co-founder. Like, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a whole group of friends and family that have all uh, have been running this for so many years. But our, our objective is to discover the artist. Right. Yeah. And so you're going into a market, and the and the end objective is how do I find which art which which artists am I going to find today? And when we find them, we we always it's it's life changing for the artist, and that's so much fun. And I, you know, one of the artists that I'll mention is an artist that we actually found in the markets in in Peru, but we never easily find them because the markets are always it's always middlemen, right? So it's rarely yeah. rarely you're going to find the artist himself in a market. So it's always, you know, like, like a, there's a, a few middlemen you got to get through. Um, but we were looking for um, these wood carvings called Ekekos. They're good luck uh, carvings. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and we saw this incredible Ekeko, and we're like, we got to find this artist. And, um, and, and that w it was in the corner of a shop in a market in Lima. And it took us out to the outskirts of Lima. You know, one thing led to another, and we had to, by a bunch of them from that middleman in order to figure out <laughs> for them to give us any information. And they only gave us a neighborhood and then going to the neighborhood and we're, we're, we're knocking on doors and saying, do you know who made this? And, um, but that artist is Johnny Jimenez. And he's, he's one of our more successful wood carvers. And his mm. technique is just amazing. He does, and so the Akekos is, we found him with these Akekos, so just kind of a niche, you know, like who would know about an Akeko, right? It's, you know, the reason we even we were even looking for it is because there was a, a chef in a restaurant in Peru. I mean, in, in L.A., this Peruvian chef, his name is Ricardo Sarate, who is this up and coming, uh, you know, Michelin possible, you know, chef. And he's like, oh, the, my secret is this Akeko. And he's got these. So we were looking for Akekos for him. But what ended up working was the, the Peruvian Paso horses uh, that Johnny Jimenez makes. They are lifelike and amazing and the price points are not, you would think you'd, you'd be paying like hundreds and hundreds, thousands of dollars for these sculptural works of art, and they're not. And, um, and so he sold, he sold a lot of them. And it's just, it's really, um, and when we, and I think that when you have like with Johnny, um, when we found him, he was so touched when we were saying, hey, Johnny, you're going to have your own, you're going to be able to put your price. It's a market, it's our, we're a, pl a platform marketplace, right? So mm -hmm. we, you know, so. So the artists drive it. And so just like you were talking about in the, in the market in India where the, the ladies, if they put less embroidery, they might sell more and do less work, you know, like the, you know. So that happens naturally through the system because the artists for the first time in their lives are getting um, product rating reports. So yeah. if we were to tell them, if we were to tell them, hey, that's a, that's a, hypo a, a thesis that, that we would have, oh, Put, put less design and embroidery, maybe put it in the corners, you know, do, do, you know, and then we let the customers decide. So they might have, and they'll see ratings, and they'll say, okay, these are A rated, these are F rated. So let me do more of the A's. And, and mm -hmm. they get the market feedback to, to be able to innovate. Yeah. So what, um, what kind of numbers does a successful artisan do on Novica? Well, it depends on, so some of the artists are individual artists, many, many of them, over half. They're, sure. you know, when we find Johnny Jimenez, it's Johnny Jimenez carving his pasta horses, right? <laughs> so it's an individual. And some of them 
um, like Buana or Nero Goel. Um, Buana is this amazing jewelry maker in, in Bali, and Nero Goel in India, um, she's one of our leading artists. Um, they have been able to, to build up business, basically small businesses, you know, so they've, they've, they've hired, they hired people, and they have grown, and yeah, they have workshops, or they have this cottage industry where they're, there's home production, but it's kind of coming through them. And so, so they've been able to grow. So for the individual artists, um, you know, for them, a lot of times success is, you know, thirty, fifty thousand dollars a year. That's like, that's really big, big, big time success. Big numbers. You know, like we're talking uh, yeah, about a lot of artists, individual artists that are that are going from five hundred thousand dollars a month to to triple, quadruple, you know, ten times that sometimes. Um, and then Absolutely. for some of the workshops, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, I mean, those are very important numbers because the segment you're working with, um, they almost make nothing uh, and, and they are operating on very thin margins. So the kind of numbers you're talking about, especially in the geographies that you're talking about, those are very consequential numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then when you couple in the microcredit, we, we give them access to 0% interest microcredit and all the other elements, yeah. the capacity building, it's really, a, it's great. You know, when, when I've had like Johnny Jimenez see, seeing him and he wept when we, when he can't, you know, it, so it's like, okay, we're doing something right. <laughs> if we're changing lives to the extent that people are so emotional about it, you know, that, that they're, and, and so grateful, you know, that, that they're, they're, they're moved to tears. Um, something's going on that's pretty special, yeah. And, um, so and so, and talk a little bit about um, about the microfinance, the Kiva partnership, and so on, in, in the context of how you uh, facilitate the financing for these artists. Great, yeah. So in in many of our um, countries, access to credit is a big issue, um, and um, and and now more and more people are getting more access to, to to credit, which is great. But in our sector, which is a big sector. Like in a lot of our village economies, the um, the number one um, um, industry is agriculture, and the number two industry yeah. is handicrafts. So we're so handicrafts is a big um, driver in a lot of our village economies, right? But with handicrafts, very rarely it's kind of like you're saying the um, it's very disparate. There's a um, lot of intermediaries. Um, there's no access to the market or to the demand side to be able to innovate or or you know. And, um, and, and then access to credit is usually um, non-existent. Um, and so with us, um, one of the coolest things um, in, our, in our system is that artists, when they, when they start up with us or when they grow with us, they get access to more and more credit collateralized by their own handicrafts. So never mm -hmm. has that, like an artist who, and we sometimes have stories like, there's an artist who um, does tapestries um, in the highlands of Peru. And uh, his name's uh, uh, Faustino Maldonado, and he had an issue where he needed to access credit almost like a, as an emergency. And so he sent his his extra tapestries down to our office in Lima, and was immediately able to to um, collateralize that and get get zero percent interest financing out. So they're like, oh my God, my products are assets now that I can borrow money on. Um, and so and that's all uh, thanks to Kiva and our customers. We have a an artisan lending. Um, area of the website, and also um, with this amazing partnership with Kiva, um, they, um, they they it's a pass through because the Kiva the Kiva lenders are zero percent interest lenders, and we pass out all the way through to the artisans, so they're borrowing at zero percent. And uh, do the people on Kiva who lend in this mode are they also buying the products from these artisans? Absolutely. So there's a there's a Kiva store that we run for them, um, mm -hmm. and uh, that store is, is it's amazing. It's only borrow, Kiva borrowers. So it's Kiva uh -huh. borrowers um, that that then um, are looking to to provide their products to the same people that have lent them money. Then they can buy directly from the products. And if you think about it, like me, me like as a, I, I I love Kiva. I, I've 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 been involved with Kiva since the very beginning when when they were first launching. I, I was I was a lender and I just I love the concept. I love empowering people, like the whole P2P model, I just love it. And so, and, and so one of the things that I felt as a lender, I would lend and then I'm like, well, how can I help this person? Because as an entrepreneur, I know 
part of it is access to capital, but part of it is growing a business, right? We, we know yeah. that as entrepreneurs, right? And so um, yeah. access to capital is important, but it doesn't drive, you know, the, the fact is you got to run a, you got to build a business, right? And so I was always like, I, how can I help? I was lending to a, a storekeeper in Nicaragua and I'd feel like, how can I help them? You know, I'm lending money, but how can I then help them grow the business? What can I do to help them? And so with the, with the Kiva store, um, people can go in and, and they can lend money, but then they can then further help. They can buy gifts from these artists. And that's a real great partnership. And we're thankful for, for, for Kiva and for the Kiva lenders and that whole community. And, um, and then, and, and so, and, and there's thousands of artists on the Navica platform and probably over half have borrowed from through Kiva. Okay. And um, if you were to isolate the ones that you were giving examples of individual artists versus ones who have been able to scale a little bit um, to $30,000, $50,000, um, what percentage of the Novica artisans are actually building businesses on your platform? Maybe, maybe half. And, and when, um, you know, because many artists, their very first hire ever was, um, was through, through their sales with us. So mm-hmm. I consider that building. I, I think once you start employing others, um, yeah. then you're no longer in it for yourself. You're, you're building a business, right? So you're, you're, right. you're, you're, bringing, uh, you're bringing on others. Um, and then uh, probably um, there's about a quarter that I would consider um, growing workshops. You know that they're they're okay. working and they're 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 now um, they have um, the the hopes and dreams to grow grow bigger and bigger. Um, and many of them have. And in absolute terms, what are the numbers? What um, how many artisans are on the platform? And uh, so half of that is how many? Okay, so well, there's we have about um, 4,000 um, artisan groups, uh, which represent about 20,000 artisans. Um, mm-hmm. And so, the, but those 4,000 art gr- artisan groups, so about half of them um, would be um, individuals, straight individuals. You know, like that's yep. they're painters, they're carvers, they're jewelry makers, and they make make the items themselves by themselves, typically at home, and Side note on that: During COVID times, um, they've been um, very um, grateful that they're able to produce at home, and there's a no contact delivery at the office, and 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 um, and the sales have been strong from people buying online, and so the artists are very grateful about that. Um, yeah. And then there, yeah, and then there's the other um, uh, artisans that are more, um, let's call them growing, growing small businesses, right? So they're. They're, they started as themselves, and they've been able to hire people, and they're growing. And and um, and those are that's a, another really interesting segment that that um, requires a lot of capacity building. So they're they're yeah. taking on credit for for capacity building, for buying their you know buying a, a machine to help with certain things, and you know that kind of stuff. Hiring their first people, um, capital for for raw materials to to produce more. And I take it this is not an English-speaking audience at all, right? These are uh, vernacular audiences. So your staff on the ground is all vernacular uh, savvy staff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's right. That very few of our, even in some of the English-speaking regions, like um, Ghana and India, and you know, so it's um, you know most of our artis- most of our artisans in India, for example, they they speak. Um, the many, many languages of India, right? So like uh, so they might speak Hindi or Bengali or, but, but usually um, English might be second language. And, and so, and then, um, and in Ghana, um, they might speak Ga or Tree or some, or like one of the tribal dialects. And, um, and, then, and then also English um, possibly. Um, but, but so, yeah, it's mostly a, mostly um, a non-English um, a group. And um, how does the geographical distribution play out? So is it Latin America number one, and how how do you um, how do you break down the four thousand into mm-hmm. geography? You know, um, the artists like to to joke about this as as, as uh, <laughs> Navica being the World Cup of arts and crafts. So just thinking about it in, in football, soccer terms. <laughs> um, but like each country, you know, has their own strengths and their own weaknesses, and and they are, uh, um, you know, whether it's textiles or carvings or or, or jewelry or you know right. games, you know. And so and 
and there are definitely um, areas of the world with very rich artisan traditions. Um, you know, Indonesia, Bali, especially. Bali is Absolutely. known as the island of artists <laughs> because so, there's so many artists per capita in the island yeah. of Bali. It's a small island with a lot of artists. Um, India is extremely the, the yeah. it, it is amazing. Um, small countries like Guatemala in Central America, Guatemala is, is the hotbed of, um, of, of, uh, of artisans. Um, they are extremely talented artisans. And when you speak with them, they, yeah, it, it, it dates back to the Mayan times and the, these are long standing traditions. Uh, Peru right. is also very rich in, their, in the artisan um, uh, sector. Um, but um, but every country, you know, they all have, and so they they uh, the artisans band together, and they're like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do do you know make Peru proud or make Mexico proud or or Thailand, you know, so so they, every everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses, but they 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 definitely um, they definitely compete like uh, in a friendly competition, kind of like the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> so Roberto, you've uh talked about the artisans and their businesses. Let's talk a little bit about your business. You've built a $20 million annual revenue company in 20 years. Talk a little bit about the highlights of your journey and um, your impact has been vast. So share some metrics of, you know, how you quantify that impact. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the, um, so it's been, a, um, I would say, a very slow and steady build. And as, as an entrepreneur, especially as a social and entrepreneur, we that. want. This is something I want to make absolutely clear to the audience listening. <laughs> we are big believers in, you know, we, we don't subscribe to that. Everybody will have to go from zero to hundred million dollars in five to seven years and build a venture funded company. This is not at all the philosophy of one million by one million. <laughs> oh, good, good. Then I think I'm talking to the right crowd. <laughs> yes, you but, are. I can tell you our original business plan was to get to 100 million in 10 years, you know, and so we still have that aspiration and we'll, we'll do about 40 million this year. So, you know, so we're growing. Um, we hit the 20 million annual benchmark a few years ago. And then uh, last year we were mid 30 million range. And so mm -hmm. we're, but it's, it's, it's slow and steady growth. And um, our sector is, is, uh, it's always been a challenging sector, the artisan sector. Um, cause yeah. it's not the first thing people think about when they're going to purchase something online. So it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of, um, business development involved with that. Um, but yeah, the philosophy has been just build it every year, build it. And every single year we've grown. And, um, and one thing that's been a driver is tracking the number, uh, the amount of money deposited to artists, the amount of money that artists receive actually receive. Right. And, um, and that number, we hit a hundred million, uh, this year. Um, to artists, and we're seeing that it just felt like a, a, a blink ago that we were at 75 million to artists, and we celebrated that. And then this year we celebrated 100 million, and so it's like the um, you know we really want to build that to a billion. And I never would have imagined starting this 20 years ago with our whole group, with my brother, my mother-in-law, all my friends, and, and like we would would have never imagined that that we would be doing it this long. But also I don't think we would have imagined that it would have been this impactful. Like I never really, yeah. I never, and that's what keeps us going is that, you know, it's so impactful and there's so many lives that have changed. Cause when it's like, when it's one artisan whose life has changed in a village in Ghana, there are so many people around that artist that benefit from that, not just the family, yeah. the whole community benefits. And so like the impact is really um, amazing. And now that we've partnered with UNICEF and all these other great organizations, um, it's the Im impact is multiplied that way. But, um, but yeah, no, it's been, it's the steady, it's slow and steady and thinking about, you know, cash flow and we've had years where we've made money, but mostly we've um, had to figure out ways to, um, to fund the deficit, which is always hard, you know, yeah. we've got lenders and investors and, and um, we had to um, capitalize in a major way with investors to build this infrastructure. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting elements to it. And we do one day, I mean, we have our sights on a billion to artisans and, and we want to get to the 100 million a year mark. Um, very, we're accelerating right now. We want to get there rapidly. So um, talk a little bit about how you finance the company. You started with regular venture capital and 
So talk a bit about how um, how much money you raised and how did you raise that money? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, with um, with kind of traditional venture capital, just because of the way their their funds are structured and and the way that they um, it's kind of the, philo the the Silicon Valley philosophy, which I respect highly respect, you know, mm -hmm. highly highly respect. Um, part of it is you just have to you have to fail fast, right? I mean, you really do. Like they they push to 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 get to you know get that MVP out and get to get to grow to scale and test it out and see if it works. And if it works, then you then you amplify that whole that whole mindset. I love it. And we do that on on, on micro on a micro basis every day with new projects, right? We take that philosophy and apply it to new projects like our subscription box and things like that. So, yeah. um, but, but really the horizon for, for traditional VCs, it can't be like, it can't be 20 years, right? Like, like it can't, like they can't, the funds can't be structured that way. Seven to 10 years. So you have to yeah. kind of scale within that time frame. Yeah, exactly. So we're very lucky that we've, um, We've been able to um, bring on investors that are, um, first of all, patient, and they appreciate mm -hmm. that we're building a real business. Another thing that that um, helped in a way, just in terms of um, uh, dynamics, is that when a lot of our investors came in, um, our original investors, they came in during the dot-com boom and right after that of the 1999, 2000s, right? And so, um, so they, um, most of their portfolios actually didn't survive. So in many ways they were like, okay, well, Novik is a surviving portfolio company and it went beyond our fund horizon, but we do see like a future liquidity event, you know, where, where they can do, where they can do well. So mm -hmm. we hope, we hope that, that all of our original um, um, investors get a 10 X plus on their, on their invested capital. So that's, that's, so the, I'll, I'll put that aside for now and then talk about all of the, the social impact investors. Cause I think that, I think that those, that those investors, like it's really important when you're thinking about your, your capital base to think about who's, who's aligned. And if you're a mission based company, especially like us, it's great to find mission aligned investors because mm -hmm. then as you, so, mission based companies sometimes can be hard to scale, right? Um, yeah. Hopefully not. I mean, I love it when you find a, a mission-based company that scales fast. That's awesome. That that's that's the best. That's the best of all worlds. We're scaling, but we're just not scaling at the with the acceleration right. that, that we'd like to. Although we're getting some acceleration now as we're getting to scale. Marketplaces are funny that way. You 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 grow and you grow and you grow and then suddenly uh, this magic starts happening in the marketplace where where you start to get some some critical some critical mass and it's just taken us a while to get there, but we're getting that. Um, but so the, getting aligned with the investors, and we've had amazing investors, investors like the Grassroots Business Fund, they're an offshoot of the World Bank, National Geographic Ventures, awesome, yeah. awesome yeah. investor group. Um, we came in early and not really an investor group, more, they were, I mean, they were, uh, they were in a, 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 a close par business partner of ours um, that also invested and, and lent us money um, in, the early, in the early years. And that was phenomenal for growing the, growing the company is that partnership with National Geographic. And what do you see as um, the exit path for a company like yours? You are getting to 40, you will get to 40 million in revenue. Presumably you will get to 100 million in revenue over the next few years if you keep at it. Um, yeah. What kind of exit path are you seeing for this? Well, you know, in terms of, in terms of where, where we'd like to go, um, we think about it more as, we, we boil it down to one basic thing. How do we, um, um, get more more funds to artists, right? If that, and yeah. I love that it, it, we're so lucky that as a company, some companies like they have a mission, but the mission is is um, is not part of the core business, right? For us, it's the core yeah. business. It is the business. How do we if we how do we best serve artists? So whatever we can do to best serve art, like what things can we do to serve artists as our as our clients, right? The artists, right? And so as, and we when we best serve artists, we best serve customers. But what can we right. do to best serve artists? And in, in that, how can we um, increase like the value, the future value for artists? How does this become uh, like, how do we, how are we touching the hundreds of millions of artists around the world, you know, that are, that we're not, that we're not um, touching right now? How do, how do we get to them and how do we transform the entire industry? 
So that's one thing that we think about. And so we, we think, so how does, how does the company grow in that path? Um, and one of the things we're doing is, is there's a lot of partnerships. Mm -hmm. so a lot of, a lot of kind of key partnerships, especially with nonprofits. So that's, we're doing a lot of that right now. And, and in terms of an exit, like, I wouldn't say that there's a, there's a, it, it would be more like a future liquidity event. And that would be um, something that doesn't, um, the strategy is to build it as big as we can, and then the liquidity event will come. Right. right. No, I was talking more about the liquidity yeah. event for your investors. This, you know, mm -hmm. you, you have to give you, as long as you take venture money, you have to mm -hmm. give an exit to those investors. So how, that's what I was questioning. I, I presume that you want to keep building the company itself and the business itself, yeah. but, uh, mm -hmm. but how do you give liquidity? I mean, I, I'm not sure if this, the public market is the right place for a venture like this. Yeah. It yeah. Well, it it might be down the road, um, and everybody's talking about SPACs these days. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, I you know ah. for for us um, for us it's really building, like we'll, like that conversation. Luckily, we have um, a group of of backers where primary goal is let's get to 100 million in sales and really grow it for artisans, and secondarily, then we'll find the we'll find their um, We'll find a great liquidity opportunity um, for some of those investors. Is there a class of social impact investors who are willing to buy out your uh, regular venture investors and and stay in with you for a longer term? Yeah, there might be. So that might be a possible future liquidity event where there's a, a private equity fund that's socially um, driven right. um, that's mission that's aligned with us. Um, yeah, and they so they could so it could be a they could be, um, that could be an opportunity, you know. That's something that, that's, that's becoming a bit of a trend that you may want to note in the industry in that, you know, um, we, because of our work, we have been involved in early stage venture capital and early stage startups right, 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 you know, through our journey, which has been more than 10 years now. So mm -hmm. um, there is a, it, first, it started kind of like as a side thing, but now it's becoming a strategy for a lot of micro VC funds that come in early, especially in countries and, and ecosystems where it takes longer to build companies. They do maybe the first three years of the journey or first five years of the journey and then exit into a Series B or Series C funding once the company has started hitting a faster growth stride. So mm -hmm. you may have investors who have been in it for longer than they want to be in, but there are later stage ventures, later stage investors, private equity investors, or late stage venture capital investors who buy out these early investors, angels or VCs, micro VCs. And that's, that's becoming a perfectly acceptable path of how to finance a company and, and how to run funds actually. Yeah, I, I think so. I think I think um, that's definitely that's definitely an opportunity. I think some of our our earlier stage investors they see the um, they see the big possibility here. They see the possible um, like disruption of the entire industry model, where currently there's so many middlemen. And it's just taken us a while to get that network effect going. But um, right. you know, even even during COVID times right now. Um, the sales have, have increased because people are, are traveling less. And I think with right. us, when they shop with us, it's just this virtual travel experience. So people are, yeah. um, customers are really happy to, to, to travel virtually <laughs> and explore yeah. the markets, the bazaars and the markets uh, of our site and, uh, and enter and just enjoy um, receiving a package because we ship from around the world. So they get the package with the postcard signed and our offices take care of all the quality control and all that. And so they definitely, um, um, I think that's definitely a, a, um, a thing right now. And I, one of the most important things right now for us is that because the artists, um, the our artists, they, they, they survive on, on tourism and travel in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. And so right now there's very little travel, almost no tourism happening in the countries where we operate. Open markets, many of them are closed right now. So their secondary yeah. markets or domestic markets are closed. It's really, really hard. And so we're getting artists that are um, that are basically grateful that the sales 
they actually they can't believe it. They're like, it's an, the, we would have never imagined. We, we're we're um, so grateful that we have this opportunity. They produce at their at their houses. They deliver no no contact in our office. The products are quarantined for 48 hours in the in the in the regional warehouses, um, and and so they're safely producing, and they're it's a lifeline. Where in some of our countries it's really um, dire. Like in, in Guatemala, for example, there's a, um, when someone has run out of food, they put a white flag outside their house. Um, so there's all these white flag homes that are popping up. And that means that it's, it's basically a, 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 a plea for help from anyone. And so um, our artists, they're, they're telling us stories of how, um, because they have sales happening, and they're so grateful to the customers on Navica, they're buying from them, they're selling, and then they're like, if it wasn't for, for you guys, we wouldn't be able to put food on the table because we have no, you the only thing we've got. There, we have no other, there's no local sales happening at all for, for their goods. And so, and they're sending us messages saying how they're helping the block, like we're helping the village or we're helping our entire block, you know, because we have white flag homes. And so when we're buying basic, basic staples, like rice and beans and tortillas and stuff like that we're we're spreading that around the block to all the white flag homes so it is really you know we're like a major impact territory right now with with um during covid times that we never thought we'd be in um it's wonderful i love 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 your story so i'm so glad that we were able to have you on thank you let's uh I know you're going to stay for a pitch. Let's uh, switch to the okay. entrepreneur segment. Uh, folks, I want to set some expectations for those who are pitching, whether it's today or in upcoming sessions. Just know that this is a safe working session. Anyone can participate. And just don't be nervous or defensive. We have no other agenda but to listen to you and brainstorm with you on your strategy. If you disagree with the feedback you're going to get, one thing is true that if I see that I need to contradict your strategy, I will contradict your strategy because that's my job. You're not here to get a pat on your back from me. You're here to get some you know, actionable feedback so you can do something about what you're trying to do. So uh, it's your venture. You will finally decide on what strategy you want to follow but do listen, do think about what feedback you get, and then design a strategy that processes that feedback. Remember one thing, not all businesses can raise money. Not all businesses should raise money, and raising money doesn't guarantee success. And this is primarily I'm talking about the venture capital uh, format. You know, we are trying to do one million by one million. Our ecosystem is full of entrepreneurs who are not necessarily quote unquote venture fundable entrepreneurs. We are fine with that, it's okay. You know, entrepreneurship equals customers, revenues and profits. Financing is optional, exit is optional. If you're building a business, that's, you know, we're talking, we just spent half an hour talking about these artisans in Peru and Ghana and India, and if, they're building $30,000, $50,000, $100,000 businesses. That is life-changing. And these are successful entrepreneurs in our books, and they need to be supported. So we have absolutely no quarrel with people who are just building businesses. We are not, and not making investors money. That is perfectly fine. You first need to serve customers and, you know, achieve sustainable business principles, which is customers' revenues and profits. So that's the philosophy. If you are venture fundable, great, you can build a much bigger company. And that's fine. We have a terrific, terrific network of investors who work with us, hundreds of micro VCs, seed, pre-seed, um, post-seed, series A, small series A, large series A, we, you name it, we have, we cover the entire gamut. And we have investors working with us across that gamut. Um, but not all businesses are fundable. With that preamble, let's listen to Jed Alexander. Uh, Jed, would you please unmute your line and tell us what you're working on? Hi, good day, uh, Shramana and uh, Roberto. Thank you, thank you for me. My name is Jed Alexander, and I'm a founder from the UK. Um, I, I'd like to show you my, my venture. Next, please. 
So Shilla Pitch is a platform as a service for early stage startups, and we intend to launch our new uh, pitch rooms in November of this year. Next. Uh, currently, our platform looks really good, but the journey to, to get into this current state was, was, was not easy. We had a lot of pivoting. We had to understand ourselves, who our customer was, and, and then we had to find out how we give value to those customers. We are bootstrapped ourselves, and we understand that bootstrapping accounts for more money than venture capital, angel, uh, crowdfunding uh, put together. Uh, it represents over 220 billion in the US alone. Next, please. The thing, what we know is that uh, founders are resourceful. They could get money. They could find it from friends and family, uh, and they find a way to get that money or if they're passionate about the ideas. But in the early stages of starting a business, there's little guidance, and oftentimes at the end, you have little quality being presented to investors. Uh, in an article in 2019, TechCrunch wrote, investors are uh, failing to, to back founders from diverse backgrounds. I found it really good when I saw a, a rebuttal to that, where uh, this young man said, if the goal is ab about making sure people secure capital, then surely we should place some emphasis on teaching people from, from diverse backgrounds, teaching them how to kind of present their businesses, business strategies, and how to present themselves before investors. Next, please. And, and, and that's true. We found that there is a high demand for quality. And most founders don't have access to that, uh, that, that, that network so that they could present themselves in the way. Uh, uh, founders deal with passion, enthusiasm. They have great business uh, ideas, but they do not speak the language of investors. Uh, we looked at a, a model from Angel Investor Network in the UK, and we understand what founders want. And we try to build that in our first iteration of our, our platform. So, we have a lot of founders coming into the platform. They're presented very well. They could put up their businesses and have a pitch video uh, attached to, to, to their, their profile. Next, please. But what that did not guarantee was quality. So we found that we have loads of startups coming in, registering their businesses, putting it up, but there is no quality. And we had to figure out a way. So how do we culture, how do we get that quality into the platform? And we figured out we have a freeway platform. Uh, a freeway marketplace, sorry, where we have investors come in to look for startups. We have startups who are putting their, uh, their pitch up there. And we have third party businesses and services who want to help the startups, or most of them want to sell services to the startup. And we need to figure out, we needed to figure out how to create a way where each of these individuals or these uh, markets gives value to each other. We know that uh, for the investors, they want quality. So we decided to look at an option of by referral only so that the startups that come into our platform and are able to pitch live in front of investors would be referred from professionals who deal with startups, helping them improve their pitch, their delivery, their business models, and so that when investors come to us, they understand that they're receiving a certain type of quality pitches uh, presented to them. But what happens to the rest of these startups? Next, please. The way we've built Schiller is to accommodate as many uh, founders as possible coming into our system. And instead of the traditional way that most of our competitors do, they take the top performing startups, they work with them, and they send the rest off to go spend their money in any direction, we want to keep them within our funnel. So if a startup comes in or a founder comes in and they're not really trained up, they don't have the knowledge, the networking skills, we help them by providing these skills and services with the network of third party providers and keep them in their funnel until they're ready to pitch live in front of our investors. And that's our uh, contribution to it. Uh, on the other hand, we have also third party referrals where uh, professionals who have experience, who have good case studies of working with startups could send us really good startups that are ready to pitch and we present them to investors. Next. Currently, our system is manual. So we get these startups coming in, we, they, they answer a few questions, we get all of that information. And as we gradually grow our business, we want to change that into an AI model where we feed that information into AI. As we give them information back, we put also th this new information into AI, so we're feeding the AI. So over time, we will be able to identify the deficiencies of these startups really, really quickly and suggest to them uh, learning opportunities uh, through short uh, e-learning subscriptions that they could take and, and improve themselves 
so that they're able to pitch to investors, the right investor, um, presenting themselves in a much better way. Next, please. But we must give them a goal. And the goal for us is to pitch, to pitch in front of an investor or investors who actually want to hear or believe they are coming to a pitch to hear uh, um, quality startups. So we want to introduce a pay to pitch model by referrals only in our Schiller pitch rooms, where founders that are referred by professional organizations, whether it be pitch coaches, uh, accelerators, uh, other in, in, um, professionals that have worked with startups, to present a startup, we put that startup in a room with four investors, uh, and they're able to pitch sector-specific rooms. These investors uh, would, uh, what, what, what we want to culture in Chile is that these investors could refer other investors to come into our, our list of investors. So both sides, we are creating value for both sides. Investors know that they come in to watch uh, startups that have been selected uh, or sent through by pre our preferred uh, referrers. And our referrers and our startups know that they're coming to pitch in front of investors that actually are ready to invest money because they know there is quality here. Next. Our pitch rooms, we, 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 we want to make that uh, appealing to, to uh, as we say, all, all sides of the marketplace. So for the referrers, we incentivize the referrers. If an, a referrer sends us a, a, a founder who's ready to pitch, that referrer would get a commission if that uh, founder is successful in his pitch. So that uh, um, uh, incentivizes the referrer to send us the, the top uh, um, uh, founders that they work with. Uh, for, for the investors, well, they're incentivized by the fact that they know that we are producing quality every time. So it's not just a matter of a quick qualification or a pitch competition, but what, what we are presenting to them in our pitch rooms are actually founders that have done the course had support and are ready to pitch for, for, for the proper investment. Also, to make the, the, the pitch rooms really exciting for investors, and I'm not sure if investors do get excited, but we, 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 we keep it as uh, four investors per room. We send the list out to all the investors. The first four to book a room will be sat. The rest will, just, will be in the audience. Next, please. And we want to make it shareable. We want to recreate the drama of uh, Dragon's Den or Shark Tank but do it virtually because the world has moved into a, a new, um, have a better appetite for, for virtual pitches as I'm doing now. Uh, so that the, the founders could share it to their friends and family, inviting them to see them at the pitch. Investors could do so with their friends and colleagues also, so that there are deals made in actually in, in that life pitch uh, scenario. Next. But as a company, there is a social conscience with us and, and there is something that we want to do to give back. Uh, and we want to ensure uh, uh, we have had successes with our early start stage. We launched in March uh, and until August, we had 80 startups sign up and that's our, our period for testing. But we managed to have uh, almost 70% BAME, 23% white and 7% uh, female, which, which uh, in, intersects with, with our BAME community. We want to, to encourage uh, founders from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds to get the same opportunity that uh, the other founders have, those from Ivy League schools and those that have the networks. So we want to create an ecosystem that they are, they are able to access all of these uh, support services through these third party referrals that come onto the platform. Next. So who's our competition? We've borrowed from, from, from many uh, of our competitors. Uh, we're, we're not trying to compete. We cannot compete with the likes of AngelList or angelinvestment.co.uk, some of our competitors that actually match investors to startups. And as I said earlier, most of them take the top performing startups and let the rest uh, uh, fend for themselves until they're ready. We know that there's a lot of bootstrap money with those founders that they spend because they're looking for direction and a lot of them burn, burn that money in, 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 in going in different directions very often. We want to take these startups and use them uh, and help them, support them so that they grow. Kiritsu Forum is a, is a, a large company uh, in the Silicon Valley area. Uh, it, it uses a pay-to-pitch model. It's been criticized by a lot of people, but, but praised by some of the founders who have used it because they charge a, a lot of money to make found, to, for founders to be able to access their network of investors. We want to adapt a, simi a similar model and create that same environment for founders from underrepresented backgrounds, where we get qualified investors from around the world to come in and be a part of our list. So they know that when they're pitching, they're pitching to these qualified investors, but we want to lower the rate of our pitch pitch. 
So the fee that they pay is a booking fee to be sat in the room uh, to ensure that they're able to, to commit to, to come into that pitch and, and pitching for, for the investors. And if they're successful at that pitch, we, we refund them that, 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 uh, that, that uh, booking fee. Next. So what are our strengths? The, the, our strengths is we will be the first to market. Although there are loads of people performing uh, events like this over the internet, there are, there are places where you could go and you could see pitch. There is no place currently where you could say every day I could go on and I could see a live pitch where an invest, a startup is pitching to an investor, where I could book coming uh, to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and see live pitches. We want to create this kind of ecosystem where everyone knows the name Shiller Pitch as a place that they could go on and they could enter live rooms, seeing startups pitching for funding. And it's not just a practice run, it's not just a competition, but it's actual individuals who are ready, good business models, their businesses are working well, and they're looking for funding. Our weaknesses are we have many competitors in this space who have much more money than us, who funded before us, and they're good at what they do. We're not trying to compete with them. We're trying to um, um, capitalize on the opportunity that COVID-19 and the way the world has changed now has presented to us. Uh, people can present themselves online now. People are more willing to, uh, a lot of the, the large um, um, events that used to have, such as Web Summit, where people used to pay large amounts of money to go into these events, they're hoping to meet an investor. They could do that online, knowing that every single day they could actually sit in a room and, 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 and be listened to for a pitch. The threat is, the, in the UK especially, we, we just hit a recession. Some people are more skeptical with borrowing. And also uh, with us, uh, we're, we're new to market. So um, it, it takes a lot to convince investors to, to kind of trust us that we, that we know what we're doing. Next. So, um, Jed, I think we understand what you're trying to do. I understand it particularly well because I run 1 million by 1 million, and, and yes. this is squarely in that space. Um, let me point out where your real weakness is yep. in this pitch. You are assuming that every day of the year, you're going to have a fundable company that you're going to be able to put in front of investors. Yes. And that is a flawed assumption because to get to those kinds of numbers, you're going to need to be... so. You know, 0.01% of the entrepreneurs out there are actually fundable, venture fundable. And by yes. venture fundable, it's going from zero to 100 million in five to seven years. That is the very well understood domain of venture capital. Yeah. You find 365 companies who fit that, make, do the math and see how many companies would you need to bring into your platform and that is a monumental task. We, we're it not just very, looking for... Very, sorry. I, it is very, very difficult to find fundable companies. And this is the, this is the model why there are, there are over 10,000 incubators and accelerators out there in the world who all base their investment thesis or their reasons for existence on this principle of being a feeder to the angel and venture capital world. Yeah. And most of them fail for this reason, because there aren't, there, there aren't enough fundable deals in those ecosystems. So this is why I founded One Million by One Million to begin with, is that our business is not dependent on feeding people and forcing people to become fundable. Your business model assumes that you make money when people are ready to pitch and are willing to pay you to give them a slot to pitch. No. So your growth is dependent on how many people are ready to pitch and you no, have a flawed problem. You have a problem there. Listen, listen, listen. This is very complicated stuff that I'm telling you. You're going to not grasp it all at once. You're going to have to listen to this recording over and over again to fully grasp what I'm saying. But but okay. I know this world inside out. I'm probably okay. one of the biggest authorities on this topic. So, so the problem here is that you are basing your business model on the assumption that people are going to be ready to pitch and you're going to be able to charge them to be able to pitch. And this is going to be, this is going to force the community that you are building 
to force people to want to pitch, and, and you're going to try to put a square peg in a round hole continuously because most of the companies who are going to, go to come into your platform should not be pitching to investors. They should I, I, be building themselves as bootstrap companies. And, and, and I definitely agree. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I explained that well, but the companies that are coming into Sheila Pitch are not forced uh, to pitch. The, the goal is those that can make it to, to tier one will, will pitch. But we want yeah, but to... you don't. Your business model is dependent on people pitching. Yeah, from referred sources. So from uh, from contact around the world. For example, David Beckett. He does three minute pitch. He's raised over twelve million pounds in investment with with companies that he's mentored and, and brought to the table to to pitch. It's it's uh, uh, professionals like this that we connect to. They send us their their referral sources. They send us individuals that they've worked with, and we present these startups to investors. Those in our it funnel. It doesn't matter. What I'm telling you is, he's, if he has raised 12 million pounds, it's probably from a very small number of companies. My point is, you're not, not going to make the your, your numbers are, to get companies that are going to monetize your platform is going to be very low. That's my point. So you are you're building in a certain flaw in your business logic that you are you're falling into the same flaw that most incubators and accelerators out there in the world are in which is most companies should not be trying to raise money and you are tr you are trying to build this business on top of an assumption that everybody you're going to get thousands of companies who are going to be ready to pitch and and if you don't do that then your investor community is going to be turned off. They will come once, come twice, and if you present garbage to them, they're going to not come back. So, so this right. is a very complicated model to make work because the numbers are so poor. The numbers of fundable deals out there in the world is minuscule. So just hang on for a second. Let me listen to Roberto and what he has to say um, on what we've heard here. Great, thank you, and 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 Jed, it's really interesting to hear this. Um, you know what what I like about it is that I feel like it's based on two core assumptions that um, that do uh, work for me, and those two core assumptions are one, diversity, and two, quality. Um, so I definitely hear. I, I know that there's there's a lot of challenges in this, but if I can just on on diversity, I think about that a lot because if you think about like the corporate. And on the corporate side, what is it that, why do corporate boardrooms want diversity? It's really because there's, there's an advantage to having different perspectives around the table, right? Besides, obviously, the social pressure to have it, which every, every company should be thinking about that right now anyways. But the, the offering of new perspectives is really key. And when I do think about diversity in terms of startups, really, the magical startup that everyone's going for is is this is the breakthrough company right and breakthrough companies there's been studies and i did a tedx speech about how um, um people with trauma if they survive the trauma especially trauma as, as children they're more likely to have like breakthrough companies and what and, and how travel can be a, a form of breaking routines that's that's a healthy type of trauma <laughs> but really if we think about it diversity really can like if you if you're bringing new perspectives in, I, I love that whole that core that core assumption really works for me is diversity. And the second is quality. Quality is everything. So if you're putting in strict quality measures. Now then then the uh, the output of that is that to have diversity and quality um, and have quantity. That the quantity is the hard thing in this. So if you can solve the quantity factor where there's enough to have a business, and you're getting diverse. If you get diversity and quality in. There are. I'm. I'll, I'm signing up right now. I'm interested in seeing pitches from d diverse founders, and so possibly, possibly the solution is that it's not. You're not looking for venture funding, but people. Are, I mean, look at the Kiva model where people are are investing with zero percent return. Maybe they're maybe they're helping build small businesses in a, in a more of an angel fashion, right? Yeah. 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 And angel. So, um, let me uh, actually add a little bit to the point that Roberta just made. And, and I think the, the, the assumption that you should revisit is whether you want to charge people to pitch. 
because if you if your business model your business model is assuming that you can get quality in quantity this is the flaw in your business model so can you find one or two or three or 20 quality deals yes you can can i, can, can I just answer the question of paying to pitch the, the yeah. payment that we're talking about is a simple booking fee of around 50 pounds to ensure that that founder is there at that room and they have invested something. So they get referred to us by a professional. They're ready to pitch. We, we walk through them. We talk through what's, what's going to happen, but they pay a booking fee. And that's a simple booking fee dependent on the company, the size, and who they are. Uh, so we make it affordable for these, these founders so that they could book that booking fee. It's not 10,000 pounds. It's not a, a, a amount that they cannot pay. This is your business model, right? That is the only only business model you have is that booking fee. No, no, they are a business. Do you have any other way to monetize this community? Yes, I do. So when I when I showed you the slide where they come into our funnel, uh, we 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 use we we understand the deficiencies. These individuals spend money anyway. They spend money on branding. They spend money on pivoting. They spend money on UX design. We have over 17 um, service providers that have come to us wanting to sell services to these startups where we make an affiliate commission now. So we're adding these, these services. What we want to do is reach at that point where we could feed the AI models and we could tell these, these startups exactly what their deficiencies are and introduce to them short e-learning courses that they could pay for. So the subscription model within the platform is where we make money on a daily basis. The paid pitch model is from is where we get quality to present to our investors. So the the subscription model, you're trying to do a new demi model. Are all these service providers providing the content? Are you providing the content, or is it an upwork the, model where the commission is how you're making money? Commission on an upwork model. So so we're not trying to create all things. We have several service providers that are really good in that space that have been doing it for years. So we use their services and we get a commission based on all of the services that are provided to these startups. We find out what's right for our startups, we identify them, we match them to the service, and they pay us a fee. Okay, so that's, that's more workable, I think. Um, you know, basically then you're, what you're doing is a services marketplace to, for specifically for the founder community. And, and your competitor yeah. there is Upwork. Because a lot of, you know, what, what, boils, what it boils down to, what people are actually paying for out there in the um, service world, in the, up, in the startup world, are things like outsource development and, you know, SEO and, and social media marketing and stuff like that. And, and, and the largest competitor you're going to face in that is Upwork. Yes, but, um, and, and I agree uh, that that is one of our largest competitors with that model. But if if I ask, a, but it is a, a validated founder, model. The, the model is a validated model. That model yeah. works. If I ask founders in my space, people that I know, people that I've met along this journey, that or when I started this company, a lot of them, if I said, where would you go as a startup to find and, and to get uh, um, support for a startup? People don't know that they, they apply for loads of, 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 of incubators, accelerators. There, there is no recognized space for, 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 for that ecosystem. If we create oh, that- there is. Your number one competitor, if you're talking about startup advice, is us, is one million <laughs> by one million in the technology I, space. So we are very well recognized, a lot more well recognized than you are. I understand. All right. Well, try it and see. I think the, the good news is the Upwork model is validated. The question is, how do you tap in and position such that you don't break your nose in that quality versus quantity game? Because you are, what you're asked, what you're promising to people is that you're going to get them ready to pitch to investors. Now, if they're not fundable companies and if you force feed them into investors, investors are going to stop showing up at your pitch sessions and your whole, you know, value proposition is going to fall flat. So if your core value proposition is to bring startup services in an, in an ecosystem, in a marketplace mode, same as what Roberto is doing for his particular segment. If you want to do a marketplace of services specifically for startups, it's a subset of the Upwork model, that works 
but I wouldn't put it as a Shela pitch, pitch being the objective. That is flawed. Pitch is a flawed um, goal that you want to target, want to, you know, align them to, is my point. Okay. Okay. Um, Thanks very much. Robert, so you have a question from Dev Bosale, who's asking what, uh, what was your customer acquisition strategy and how that has evolved over the years since the founding? Well, the, um, that's, so, that's an interesting question. We, we often thought about the artisan acquisition strategy. And my head is still in Sheila Pitch, so I want to make sure I have a second more to, because to, I, I do love the, the approach there. Um, and um, so we thought about it as artisan acquisition, and we realized that, you know what, to grow this, it's all about customer acquisition. Because the artisans came so easily in our market. And as a matter of fact, thinking about quality, you know, and, and, and you know, we um, even today only accept one in three artists. Um, so we were we were always very careful about about um, bringing artists in so that we could create the best possible system for artists. But that quality level is what brought in customers. And so I think it's really important to get for customer acquisition to get customer life to do your testing and get the customer lifetime up. Because if you can get the customer lifetime value up, because when they come, they come again and again and again, right? Then it changes what you can do on customer acquisition, um, and you're you're able to because in our market it, we're we, we're not in a high conversion style market, you know where you, you're not going to get five ten percent conversion rates um, on in artisan products, so you really have to um, make sure that the system works so that if you get that first the customer purchase that they'll purchase again and again. So um, that's my advice. There is you know look for increasing customer lifetime value. Um, and then you can pay partners a lot to bring in customers. Like we have to do business development where we give partners, you know, 15, 20, 25 percent. Our affiliate model, um, we, have, we, we work with Impact Radius Impact on the Impact platform. Like we pay, I think we're one of the highest payers because we can pay high commissions for affiliates because once that customer comes, they come again, again and again. They love, they love what, they love the system. So that's what we've done is we've solved it. We've, we've, we've created a system for, for customers. Now, side note on, on Sheila Pitch, um, I just, you know, one of the things that, that uh, I'm thinking a lot about is how, how Kiva has been so successful, um, you know, with this, with, you know, they've got, they've raised over a billion and, and their expectations for the, for the lenders are nothing, 0% interest, right? And so possibly with something like, Sheila Pitch, because I know I've been on the, on the, on the out, like I'm an outsider. When I was trying to get into investment banking, I felt like an outsider. My friends that um, they were all outsiders, like there's an insider game and there's an outsider game. And that's what I love what you guys are doing with the million by million, because you guys are creating an inside track for people. It's real, you know, mm -hmm. and so like, I, like there's an outsider track, the diversity is out as an outside track. And if, if the expectations of investors are, I want to get a 10% return. And I want to invest in, 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 in diversity because that's, that's, what, that's the future. And that's where possible breakthrough ideas are going to come from. from. And if I get a 10% return plus, plus warrants or something like that, like if their expectations are different, then I think that maybe like the quality thing, because quality, like the 1% or less than 1% quality, that's for like a venture fund, $100 million company, seven to 10 year, right? That's crazy, crazy quality. And anyone that's that, that has that much quality, then they don't have to pay for any of this stuff. They just, they, they're, they've got an inside track. But I think it's the, it's the ones that aren't considered quality by those traditional met metrics, but that might be fundable. I think that's, there's, I think there's something there, Jed. So I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I think differently. I think that's what I'm pointing out. You know, our, for us, diversity is built in, right? One million by one million is not going to be all white males. We yeah. work with constantly black and women and all kinds of entrepreneurs, and we work geographically just like you. We work, I mean, of late, we have so many entrepreneurs coming from Africa and where we don't do any marketing. They find us. You know, good entrepreneurs find resources, and we are out there. So we are sufficiently out there at this point that people can find us. But the point I'm making is that if you, if you position something as you come here and you're going to meet investors who are, you know, who are basically on that 
feeder tracks to the venture capital market, their expectations and their requirements and their, their bar is exactly the same as further down the line, the Series A people and the Series C people. This is why this model is very complicated to scale, you know, because there are these kinds of companies that are not available in quantity. And, and yes, diversity has a problem to get into the networks, but, but the investors are not, but you need a set of investors then who don't want to, you need to set that expectation in your programming, in your positioning, and in your messaging that this is not some not for venture capital pitching. This is not pitching for venture capital, and and that I think is is not easy to do. Kiva has set it up as a nonprofit, as an in, impact investment where people fund projects. There is no yeah. expectation of return on investment other than social impact. That positioning yeah. and that messaging is very, very well done. So, Jed, by all means, look at how Kiva has done it. And for you, you have to make the call whether this is a nonprofit or a for-profit business. Upwork is a successful for-profit business. They've gone public. They took a long time. Like you, Roberto, Upwork has been around for a long time and, and took them a lot of years to go public. It didn't grow as fast as they thought they would grow, and they had to merge two companies, Odesk and Elance, to, to get there. But that model is an accepted model. So, so if you go the for-profit route, then Upwork is your comparable. It is your proxy. You're taking a subset of Upwork, but be careful about how you position it, so it's such that you're not setting the expectation that everybody needs to be ready for venture capital, and then you attract a set of investors who are expecting venture-scale companies, and if they attend two of your pitches and you don't present them venture scale companies, they're not going to come back. So you need to preserve the integrity of your investor community, otherwise they're going to go away. That's what I'm saying. We Thank deal you. with this all the time, right, because we have numerous entrepreneurs who perhaps would want to get introduced to investors, because, but if, we, if they're not ready and if we send them to investors, then these investors will not look at our deals anymore. Right now, the value of one million by one million is we send curated deals to investors, and that's why they look at our deals. And the minute you lose that credibility, they're going to write you off. And if you lose the investor side of the marketplace, then your value has completely gone to zero. Yeah. Right? Okay, I hope that helps. We have a lot of questions, actually. Um, uh, Shayla Pitch, uh, Jed, this question is for you from Ashok Shanmugam. Are you planning freemium with subscription model and expand? Do you want to take that question, Jed? Yeah, yes, I, I, I want to. Um, what, what, what we realize with, uh, with placing something on, on the platform for free, uh, and that was our early stage learning, was when something's for free, especially in, in, in this ecosystem, startups come in, they plant a profile, and they walk away because there are so many providers doing that. So, uh, they just plant it and, and walk away. And it's really about f identifying what the value is first. So for now, every, anyone who comes on the platform, they could plant their, their, their post, their, their, um, their, their page up for free. Uh, we, we do not charge for that. Uh, we need that introduction. It's after we identify the deficiencies, then we introduce them to the right package. So it's not a standardized package that we, we have for every single person, but we tailor it based on the deficiencies of each, each founder. Good, good. All right, folks, um, let me give you a quick segment on how to use 1 million by 1 million and what expectations we set here. So as you can see, this is a very dynamic discussion. We want Shela Pitch to succeed. So what we are trying to do here is to brainstorm about where are the gaps in the assumptions and, and what could plug those gaps and you know, whether you need to tweak the positioning, you need to change the business model, so on and so forth. And um, so it's a constructive brainstorming session. It's a working session. You don't want somebody to go in front of investors without the ducks all lined up because you don't get that many chances to meet investors. You know, if you're going to do 40 investor meetings and everybody says no, 
for the next six months, you're not going to be able to go back to any of those 40 people. You get one shot. So maybe for the next year, you won't be able to get back to any of those 40 people. So you have to, before you go up in front of an investor, you want to make sure that you've got your ducks lined up and you're able to answer these questions. So, so that's why we do so much work behind the scenes before we bring you on to investors. And this is a very, very big thing we've learned in 10 years of doing this is most startups are not ready to go in front of investors. So there's a lot of work involved before you're ready to go to investors. And, and if you understand that and if you acknowledge that, that's the only kind of entrepreneurs we are willing to work with in 1 million by 1 million. So if in your network, you have entrepreneurs like that who, who understand that you know, long road and a lot of work, a lot of rigor, please send them here. Otherwise, don't send them because we can't work with assumptions that you know, I've subscribed to 1 million by 1 million and I'm immediately going to get an introduction to investors. That's not the kind of people we work with. Um, now, the other uh, thing is our assumption is you don't have to, to make progress with your business. Your focus should be business development and customer acquisition, not just funding. Because as you start getting traction, as you start getting product market fit, as you start getting traction, that's how you build your value. You build your value, you build your validation, you build your sustainability, and you build your fundability. So a lot of the work that we do is really in that world, in building your product market fit, in you know, whether you need to treat positioning, whether you need to be introduced to customers, potential channels or channel partners, doing PR so that customers can find out about you, et cetera. That's a big part of what we do in 1 million by 1 million. So in any case, you can find everything at 1mby1m.com. Look it up and see if this is the right program for you. We are not the right program for everybody. We are the right program for people who can deal with a lot of self-learning and a lot of work. This is a very rigorous, serious program. Um, if you read just the blog, you'll get a sense of the kinds of discussions we have and how much strategy is involved in doing a successful startup. The blog is free, so if you just read the blog, you're going to learn a lot. The Entrepreneur Journey series on the blog is really powerful. We've had over a 1,000 entrepreneurs participate in that. Um, that includes 100-plus unicorns, 400-plus venture-funded companies, another 400-plus bootstrap companies. So we put lots of emphasis on bootstrapping. Um, we don't force you into a funding round. So Entrepreneur Journey is actually a book series also, if that's what you want to learn with. It's all available digitally on Amazon. Uh, these roundtables happen every week. 500th roundtable is coming up next um, in September. Uh, this is, you know, a lot of people have been here. The full acceleration program from 1 million by 1 million is the premium program, and we offer you extensive methodology guidance. We have a terrific curriculum for only technology and technology-enabled services. We don't do anything else. We do e-commerce, which because that's a technology-enabled service, but we don't do, you know, we won't do a nail salon or a laundromat or a restaurant. These are not, this is not in our sweet spot. We also don't do the heavily capital efficient, uh, capital intensive stuff like pharma, you know, drug development, solar power, water desalination. These are very important technologies, but it's not in our sweet spot because they're very capital intensive projects. We don't do those. So um, that's it. Go to, and now here is a very interesting tool that you can look at. And Jed, you may want to look at this as well. It's the one M by one and self-assessment. An investor is looking I'm looking for answers to all of these questions. This is a free tool that is available on our website. These, these are questions that you need to be able to answer in a satisfactory way to be able to have a positive investor discussion. So until you're able to do that, don't go in front of investors. If you get stuck on methodology points, you can do one and by one in basic, which is our curriculum only option, and that's 
You can do it at your pace. There are hundreds of hours of curriculum in the program. It depends on how much time you can put in. If you can do 100 hours or 300 hours in one month, one month subscription would be enough if you need more time. You can do it at your own pace and you can do it from anywhere you want. Uh, the premium program is described, actually both the programs, premium basic and all the free resources, everything is described in lots of detail on the website. Please go through it and see if this is for you. If it's for you, we'll be happy to work with you, but with the right expectations. The curriculum is described in great detail on the website. It is a case study and video lecture based curriculum. We have tons of videos, tons of case studies, and we have created a, an efficient way such that you can stand on the shoulder of other people who have done it before and done it successfully. They talk about your success, their successes and they talk about their failures and you learn a lot by uh, through these case studies and specific topics are explained with good case studies. Our methodology again is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups. The philosophy is bootstrap first, raise money later or not at all. It's okay if you don't raise money. We have case study after case study of people who have built very nice companies with no outside financing and that's just fine. And then there, we also have relationships with companies that lend money. You know, this is not venture capital. Um, you know, we have uh, just a few weeks ago, we had a, um, an investor that lends money. Once you get to $15,000 monthly recurring revenue, you can start raising debt capital that will help you finance the cash flow. So there, there are all these different partnerships that we have put in place and a lot of this stuff is built into the program with the philosophy that not everybody can raise venture capital. Over 99% of the entrepreneurs who try to raise venture capital get rejected. What would happen to that other 99%? We have built strategies so that the other 99% doesn't take that rejection from venture capital as a failure, but build companies anyway, because a lot of ideas, you know, venture capital is for these billion dollar ideas, but the, there are so many other ideas that are 5 million, 10 million, 15 million, 20 million dollar ideas that are perfectly fine to build. You just have to build it differently with different strategies and not go break your nose by trying to hit on VCs and get rejected. You know, 45 rejections, is very, very discouraging. It's kind of soul sucking. You know, you go around and, and do your road show and everybody says no. It's very depressing. I've been on this road. You know, I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. I did three startups in the 90s. And, um, you know, these, are, these were different times. Um, I, had, I had started doing product development in India before it was cool to develop products in India. So in 1997, I built my first MVP product and had paid customers with the entire engineering done in India. And every VC, 45 VCs rejected me because it's too risky to do engineering in India. I'm like, what are you talking about? There's no way I could have built this product in the American cost structure. The only way I could get this far with valida validation, with paying customers because I did my development in India. This was 1998, 99. In 2003, every VC is asking entrepreneurs, do you have an India strategy? Are you building products in India? But I was early. I was four years too early, three, five years too early. And that is a reality. You know, when you are, entrepreneurs often have, often fail because of timing, by the way. You know, you could be a little bit too soon. Like look at what's happening with COVID, right? But to online learning. Online learning is booming in this COVID era, but many of the online learning companies have had to struggle for years, growing slowly, just like Roberto's company has grown slowly. The whole online learning sector has grown slowly, but now it's finding its stride, it's coming on its own. Many unicorns are operating in the online learning space. So that's just the reality of our lives as entrepreneurs is a lot of things that we do take time to mature. And if you are a really good entrepreneur with real conviction, you figure out how to navigate that time and you listen. You listen to feedback 
you try to plug the holes and you try to navigate around the, you know, the, the holes that you can fall into and lose your existence, basically. And, and, and a very um, popular saying that I like and I use a lot is you have to survive to succeed. You can't go out of business, then you will not have a chance to succeed, right? So you have to survive. All right, so that's, um, that's One Million by One Million's show today. Upcoming free roundtable September 10th is a milestone session, 500th roundtable. And um, then we have you know, two more in September. We also have online rendezvous on LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live, and Twitter Live on Tuesday morning. So that's all of September. Every Tuesday in September, we have sessions. Next week, we don't have one. Um, we have five minutes left of the scheduled session. If you have questions for me or Roberto, please go ahead and ask your questions. And uh, it's great that we're getting all these audience questions. It's, it's always great to see audience participation. If you would like to call in, please do. While you're doing that, let me also introduce you to Irina Patterson on our team. If you have questions about the 1M by 1M program, Irina would be a great person for you to communicate with, Irina at 1M by 1M.com. She is um, very knowledgeable about 1 million by 1 million, can listen to you and tell you whether this is the right program for you or not. Questions, folks? We are ready to wrap up. Last call for questions. I don't see any more hands up. I had seen Nitin Bajaj's hand up a little bit earlier. Nitin, do you still want to ask anything or weigh in? Hi, I have a question for Rebecca. Yeah, go is, ahead. This is Irina Patterson. <laughs> Rebecca, I have it on the chat. So my question was, did you try to establish any operations in any of the former Soviet Union Republic or in Russia? Irina is Russian. Oh, so. Are you Russian? I am a Russian, yeah. but I'm an American. I've been in America for 28 years. Yes. Wow, Original. so interesting. You know, the, um, our, our co-founder, um, um, Armenia, who's also my, my mother-in-law, and side in very interesting side story there it's been amazing doing business with so many friends and family <laughs> but she um she uh studied in in she speaks seven languages and she studied in moscow and um she speaks fluent russian and um she's always wanted to do something in in russia or one of the former uh republics and i think the one that's next on deck is um is not one that you would think. It, it, we think it, um, possibly next on deck is Armenia, um, the country. Um, so and um, and and that's in in possible um, partnership with with USAID. Um, so um, that that would be fantastic. Um, we're working we're working on that one. And um, so no no near term um, prospects for us opening in, in Russia, but. Um, but Armenia is a slight possibility right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because I know Russia is very big on artisans and uh, they have really bad situation as far as the income. Um, despite of the, all the changes, a lot of people, they still struggling. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's such a geographically diverse country. You know, I, I think sometimes where we do the best and offer the most impact is when we go to more uh, rural regions. I can see us in, in some of the more um, rural areas of Russia and playing a, an interesting role there. Yeah, there's so many countries we'd like to open in. The ones that are near term are, are possibly Nepal, Haiti, the Philippines, and Armenia. Um, but we'll, we'll put Russia back on the list. <laughs> That's wonderful. Armenia is fine. I've been to Armenia. Armenia is a very artistic region. Armenia should do well. Yes, very artistic. Yeah. One of my best friends is actually Polish Armenian. So yeah, Armenia is a very interesting geography. Very. All right, yeah. folks, we are approaching the end of the session today. I think I've answered all the questions. Roberto has answered all his questions, and uh, Jed has answered all his questions. 
Jed, uh, all the best. By all means, figure it out. You know, everything can be done as long as you figure things out and, and you know, make the right choices, the positioning choices and the right nuances can be built into a business. It's a matter of scale. You know, you can build something smaller and that's okay too. You can build something, you know, with a business model that is appropriate for your business. And, and those are the choices that determine whether a company is successful or not. Thank um, you very much. You're very welcome. Yalini Sen is asking to see Irina's email again, irina at 1m by 1m.com, really simple. Um, feel free to contact her. All right, folks, thank you for coming today, Roberto. It was great having you, great seeing you actually on video. And uh, if you're in the Bay Area, do stop by and I'd love to meet you in person. Well, after COVID, of course, right now we're not seeing anybody. Bye-bye, <laughs> yeah. take care, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.